Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Weathering the Workforce Storm. I'm Stacey Dre, our Marketing Director for James Moore and Company, and I'll be your host. On behalf of our firm, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Our presenters today are Aaron Creedon, Senior Talent Acquisition Specialist, and Katie Howard, Senior HR Consultant. Erin has several years of talent acquisition experience. At James Moore, she helps fill positions for our HR solutions clients and for the firm. And Katie Howard has nearly 20 years of professional HR experience in multiple leadership and consultative roles. At James Moore, she provides outsourced HR solutions for our clients. Okay, with all that said, I'll hand things over to Katie uh, to get the presentation started. Okay, thank you so much, Stacey, and thanks everyone for participating today. So just to hit the high notes of what we're gonna cover today, um, we're gonna do a quick kind of deep dive into human capital. Um, we're gonna cover the current issues you guys are facing in your workforce. And this might be stuff you already know and you're gonna might be shaking your head, but there might be some things that you didn't really think about and the ones that you know you don't know what you don't know on problems facing your workforce. Um, then Erin is actually gonna cover some metrics and current tools to kind of fill up those holes um, and identify those holes in the workforce. And then at the end of the um, presentation, she's also going to give some best practice ideas that are really cost effective and won't really hit your budget um, and, and really drive those dollars down. So let's go ahead and talk about why um, human capital is so important and why it's so important to understand. Because at the end of the day, that's kind of the top of the umbrella. You got to have the quick understanding before we can kind of dive into the problems and dive into the resolutions. So human capital, and I'm going to refer to it as HCM. It's one of those wonderful HR acronyms we love to use so much. Um, it's like the overall life cycle of employee from the time they come on board to when they're performance managed and even when they're like leaving the organization. And so it's that overall viewpoint of a human, like, a, a, excuse me, of a staff member and how they are to the organization. It's not an expense though. So don't expect to look at your balance sheet and see it as a line item under your payroll. It's more of an economic value perspective. So what's their education? What's their training? Are they, how is their actual physical health in the organization? And how they stack up with their team members and then how ultimately everything works together. And that's the value of um, the human capital. And the more you invest in human capital, the more productive your team will be and it will obviously um, increase citizen interaction. So let's keep going with that and understanding. So you know your office is only good as your people and they are the direct face to your public and how your public interacts with all your offices and departments. So investment in your HDM is gonna be necessary. You gotta invest in your recruiting and hiring, your training and development. Um, you gotta look at how efficient they're being, their performance, how effective they're being to the team, how effective they're being to the public. And you've got to really learn how to retain your staff using a holistic HR approach. This is kind of a new mentality that not necessarily just governments haven't used. Um, overall HR, it's more so at the end of the day, you look at the employee as a whole. We used to love to look at an employee and say, hey, employee, clock in, do your job and go home. Well, this looks at employee outside of work. What gives them purpose? How do we carry on their purpose through their day-to-day -day life into our workplace so that in the in correlation with their purpose, it becomes our purpose, and everybody wants to work together for an overall purpose. So here's a fun fact. Although it's not on your balance sheet, um, human capital actually can depreciate. Specifically, most recently, it, you probably had some depreciation of your human capital when it came to COVID. So you might have had people do forced PTO or time off, even working remote, and they're not used to working remote, they might have had a lot of downtime. So they lost some of their skill set. Well, that causes depreciation on your human capital. And it's interesting because also technology and lack of innovation will also depreciate your human capital. So if they're not learning more and getting out there and doing the next bigger, better things, it's going to slow their growth down. And at the end of the day, even though it's not necessarily on your balance sheet, you do get a return on investment and you wanna optimize your human capital and gain that competitive advantage. Now I know, local government, who's your competitor? Well, it might be yourself and wanting to do something better and it might be a private entity. It really depends on 
how you reflect, and what you want to do better within your organization. Oh, and we already have a polling question because I'm going to get it a little deeper. Thank you so much, Katie. In just a minute, I'm going to launch our first polling question. So everybody, you should see that on your screen. So which park and rec character are you? So I see a lot of answers coming in, but we'll give everybody a few more seconds to answer this. And just a sneak peek, we have a lot of people who have never watched Parks and Rec. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll give you all just another few seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Again, if you missed this, put your response in the Q&A. And we're going to share the poll here in just a minute. Okay. And I'm not sure if you all are seeing this, okay. but we have 64% of you said none of the above. I've never Aww. watched it. 20% said Leslie Knopf. Nope. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I don't watch that. <laughs> And 8% said Ron Swanson. So I'm going to close this poll and Katie, turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. So now we're going to, you know, sticking with the weather, um, the weather theme in our presentation, what is causing these high pressure fronts? What are the problems of, you know, in the workforce world, specifically to local government? I know not everybody's in local government, but since it's a government series, we're really focusing on that. And really, it boils down to three. And I get to be, I, I, I joke with Erin because really next she'll get to bring in all the fun stuff. I get to be the bad news bear. So it's all about the areas are, that are most impacted are your recruiting practices, uh, your retention issues, and then boomers retirement, the mass retirements that are coming up in your organization and people leaving. But let's start with recruiting practices. So I don't know if I've already mentioned, I think it was in my bio, but I actually, when I say, I'll say we a lot in this presentation, just specifically because I worked in local government for five years. I was a senior director of HR. So all these problems I've ta I'm talking about, I've actually been through. So I really sympathize with the struggles you guys go through with your workforce. And a big issue I had was competition with other employers for talent. Now, specifically, I'm from Camden County and that's where I worked. And we had an issue because we were technically a rural county. We were about, I'd say, 45 minutes from metropolitan Jacksonville. And from that point, we had to compete with all the employers there, even the local government there. JFRD really liked to take um, our already groomed firemen and EMS staff because they had already been trained by us. Then ultimately, they could use their experience and put them right in their program. The employees loved it because they um, actually were already pre-trained and then they were also getting higher compensation and benefits. But as even a top five employer in Camden County, our staffing pool was really slim. We had competitions with the base, we had competitions with private employers. It was just a really, um, even nonprofits. And then right now there's even kind of a third element with unemployment. Now in the state of Florida, that's supposed to be you know, and I don't want to make this a political conversation at all, um, so please don't take that. But it is affecting, you know, especially lower cost jobs. Employees are seeing that it's more affordable maybe for them not to pay to daycare and they're making the same, if not more, to stay home. So lack of capacity is also an issue. For instance, in my case, again, I like to refer to my, my past experiences. Um, I actually only had four employees. One was actually dedicated to benefits. Um, specifically to recruiting, I only have one employee recruited, uh, dedicated to new hires and recruiting. I supported her, but for the most part, that was her job role. And so a lot of the jobs, yes, we didn't have an, a huge amount of job postings, but for instance, if an office specialist came out, um, and that was, I would say, a coveted job for Camden County, she would potentially get 100 to 150 applications. So for one individual to screen that much, it was really labor intensive. And so it would there be a delay and we are in the world of instant gratification. So if, and 
potential employees aren't getting answered because there's a delay in review of their applications, they're going to go elsewhere where they are going to receive that instant gratification. Um, and this is kind of just a nature of the beast. I don't, with city government, I don't think it's as much, but with uh, county government, I saw it a lot more. And when I say inconsistent processes and standardization, it's just because, you know, there was this overall administration umbrella under the county, but then we had constitutional offices that were allowed to do, you know, that had their own hiring processes, their own recruiting. They might want to use us to do their postings or process their paperwork, but at the end of the day, they could make their hiring and firing calls, and we might not necessarily know it and still be recruiting for that position. So there was a lot of inconsistency in who was doing what, and the left hand didn't necessarily know what the right hand was doing. Uh, we struggle sometimes with visibility and marketing of our roles, and that's not necessarily to say we don't have these amazing websites and places to post, but we might not use our social media so much. We might not go out on Indeed or LinkedIn. We expect people to kind of come to us, um, and our job descriptions might become boring, unfortunately. We're very accustomed. I mean, I, would, I did it myself, accustomed to posting the job description. And calling that a job ad. I mean, knowing what I know now, that's probably not the best interest, but it's what I did. We also, this is a consistent one, and I'm going to talk more about it in retention. However, there are limited compensation and benefits offerings, um, and you only have so much flexibility. So I like to use the, the example of an IT person. More than likely, if you're hiring a high-level IT person, they have multiple job offerings. And they're going to select who they want to select because it's what they want. It's not that they have a limited choice. So if you're in, say, a final two in a selection for a candidate, well, and they come back to you and say, okay, I want to work here. I love your organization. It's close to my home, whatever it might be. But I need my salary to be here. And I need my, you know, I need my benefits instantly. Or I need a PTO right away. And everything is landlocked. Well, because of our pay grade system or our matrix system, because of your experience and how many years and what grade that is, well, this is the hard stop of where your role is. So there's no flexibility to obtain that or compete with, say, other offers. You're going to lose talent that way. And last but not least, and I know there's going to be a couple people potentially rolling their eyes and I apologize. But when I talk about archaic technology and processes, I specifically think of Tyler Technologies. And I know government finance people love Tyler Technologies. But, and it's been a couple of years, so I'm hoping it has improved. When I was using it for our HR program, it was basically a payroll processing, maybe basic information holder. It didn't do well on changing statuses. It sure didn't communicate with our applicant tracking system. So I myself was housing about 10 spreadsheets and I know my counterparts were probably doing the same and I guarantee our spreadsheets weren't talking to each other. So once again, it kind of went back to that lack of capacity and slowed the process down overall. So let's talk more about now retention issues and I, specifically with compensation. I kind of touched on it with recruiting like we're going to get struggle and marketing ourselves with potential applicants. We struggle with that also internally with our retention. And I get it. Budgets are tight and you're only allowed to work with what you had and tax judges digests are small. We specifically really struggled with that because residential was our biggest part of our tax digest. But we all know commercials where the money comes from. But and now you've got commissioners or councilmen and they're going to political push to spend available dollars on visual stuff like they want to do, you know, back of a better term, the sexy items, the road projects, the parks projects, the real visible things that attracts voters. A three point one million dollar across the board increase for administrative staff or even with public safety, that kind of helps because, you know, you always want officers on the street. You want your fire rescue. But that big metric change just for end use tax dollars, that's really hard to sell to your, your voters. It's really hard to sell to your citizens. They like those tangible items. And going back to those inflexible pay structures, yes, they were created for equality. It was a great idea. It didn't matter who you were, where you came from. If you had this much experience and you were in this job role, you got paid that. But you lost your marketability in the process. And without marketability, it's inflexible. And people are going to go where they feel valued financially. So interestingly enough, we were actually 10, I think we as the government tend to require more job requirements, but pay less. 
And I found that was interesting in the fact that 48% of um, government employees are degreed, while only about 24%, 25% in the private sector are. And their, their salaries are still 11 to 12% lower. And even the overall compensation, like if you look at an overall total compensation packet, it's still 7% lower. And that gap used to be a little bit closer because the government was always, always known for offering amazing benefits. Those benefits now are costing a lot. So where do you hit cost control? Well, you gotta do some adjustments. You might have wellness programs to get your people better so they're not using their premiums and you know your MLR rates are going down. Same with high deductible plans. We know that barely anybody has pensions anymore. And if who can afford them? So you're going to you know lower cost 403Bs. And you're lessening contributions, whether it be matches. I mean, I was always selling the point that the match where we were was like 9% when it traditionally it may be 3%. And same with, you know, your benefits contributions for your major medical. You only are minimally required to pay 50% of the premium of the lowest cost medical offering. But at the same time, government loves to pay everything, but they can't do it anymore. And then we struggle with engagement um, as well. And so first let's talk about why engagement is important. It does everything from higher, increased productivity, lower, you know, keep people from leaving the organization. It even lowers absenteeism. If a gauge worker wants to be at work or it's better to be <laughs> when it's more fun at work than it is at home, heck yeah, I'm gonna be at home, I mean at work. So therefore those, all those positive experiences are then transferring on to the citizen and taxpayer engagement. So that's all going to increase if overall engagement's um, up. So, and they're two times more likely to stay in their job. They're two and a half more times uh, to feel rewarded that they're making a difference. There's that purpose talk. You want to always make an um, employee feel like they have purpose. And they're two and a half more times likely to recommend um, to their friends to work, which again, great candidate pool for struggling with the candidate pool. We want people to recommend where we work. But what lowers engagement? And a lot of times it's leadership issues. And we get in the habit of, say, Joe, he's been an analyst for you know 23 years, and now the director of finance is now open. Well, Joe might not ever want to be a manager, but we promote Joe anyway. And he's not really good at it. And then, of course, it affects the overall department and how they're viewing their interactions at the department. You know, tenure doesn't necessarily mean leader. Also, leadership issues can be sometimes out of our control. You know, for four years, you might have a council or a commissioner, um, a commission that is really highly pro-employee, really engaged, and then something happens and they lose their voting, you know, their, their seats and new commissioners or councilmen come in and they're not pro-employee. So that can really change the temperature of the overall organization. Um, leadership also could be because of lack of career professional development. People kind of want to know their paths. They want to know there's opportunities for growth. And then finally, in, um, inadequate recognition programs. It doesn't mean you have to have these high cost rewards and pinnings and lunches. You can do a lot of affordable things um, and still recognize your staff. But I really want to talk about morale and the negative impacts um, in retention. And I know, especially recently, um, I've noticed this most in my time uh, with fire rescue. I know it's also going with the sheriff and police officers right now, but let me talk about fire rescue for just a second. These guys and ladies are short staffed. They're often, um, especially specifically with EMS and paramedics, they might be an aged worker. Um, not that I'm being discriminatory, but they're, they're, they tend to be a little bit older. They're strained on their resources. They're strained on their equipment. They're physically strained and exhausted. They're exposed to the elements. And then with the new COVID issues, you know, they have to wear a lot of extra PPE and all these, you know, we're in Florida, the temperatures impact. It causes frustrated, exhausted, easily injured workers. And then there was this, also this undertone of leadership mistrust. And I don't know if that's specific to all fire rescue um, departments. However, with ours, I think the rural aspect had to play. They were just really fragmented. This district was way over here. This district was another 30 miles away. So I think communication broke down. And when you have an authoritative management approach where it's like top down, I'm the chief, I'm the captain, I'm the lieutenant, 
it's our way, you know, or the highway, and they don't feel like they can ask questions, um, I think they fill in the blanks a lot of time. And that caused a lot of problems with our team um, for fire rescue. And then God bless the police. Unfortunately, um, you know, and again, not trying to make this a political speech, not trying to go there by any means, but with public opinion and media scrutiny the way it is, it's a very hard to be an officer of the law right now and, you know, and not feel that tension. Um, a lot of times they're under-trained, they're short-staffed too, they're not getting any time off, there's openings, um, because they're bringing new people in, they're really under-trained. And then you've got to bring people in for leadership that haven't been in leadership roles. Just over this past year, I think, what was it, 50 of the 50 major cities, 23 chiefs either retired or resigned. They just had enough. I know I'm really starting to feel like the bad news bear, you guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> So we're also going to talk about with retention undefined culture. Um, a lot of times, again, with spread out counties, each entity has its own culture. So it's, there's a cohesion problem. Uh, the top down mentality, what the board says goes and it goes, you know, don't question. No, there's a challenge for change. No, I, I have to admit, I struggled with this during my tenure. It was, well, we've always done it this way. We've done it this way. We've always done it this way. Don't ask why we do it. That's just why we do it. Doesn't mean it's the best way, but again, that's the mentality. And then back to that broken communication, unsolicited viewpoints. That can even go back to our citizens. They sure like to give their opinions. And sometimes, you know, a constant negative opinion from a same very verbal group can give you a really negative vibe to your culture. So now the third. Um, item I want to talk about is what we call, and I didn't know this term prior, was the silver tsunami. So these mass amount of retirees that can be moving out of your organization. So I want to kind of give you a polarizing statistic. And I could talk about, you know, oh, 10,000 people turn 65 a day. I could talk about, you know, more people are over, you know, over 60 than five and under. I could talk about this, but the one I just was shocked in doing my research for this, this actual presentation is that 30 to 40% of local government employees are currently, like today, eligible to retire based on their age or pension value. So again, I had a 500 employee organization, 150 of my people as of today could walk out and retire. If I'm struggling for vacancies already, I can't even imagine. That, let's say even said I had like, you know, 15. Just let's add, you know, oh, more than 100 onto that. It, it would just, I would probably have a small stroke. I'm not even going to lie. Probably not the best worst to, thing to say, but it's the truth. I can't even imagine being an HR director and dealing with that kind of volume of employees leaving. Because, again, issues associated with that kind of volume. You have instant institutional knowledge drain. Who knows how to do the job? You're missing big chunks of each department. So your services are going to completely just completely go. And your, your staff and aren't just going to notice it. Your citizens are going to notice it. Um, there's going to be an abundance of vacancies. Like I said, if you're having difficulty filling your current vacancies, add another 100 to 200 onto that. That's almost completely unable to overcome. I don't even know how you overcome that obstacle. So hypothetically, let's say you take some initiatives and you find a way to retain these retirees to keep them on so that maybe you can kind of slowly move them out of the organization. Well, your costs are still gonna impact. Your cost of your healthcare is gonna go up because again, not being discriminatory. However, aged workers use your healthcare more. So the premiums are gonna go up and you have to redisperse that on your other staff to maintain affordability. Your workers' comps are gonna go up. There's gonna be more injuries as well. So all those costs are also gonna, it's almost like you can't escape the end game, unfortunately. At some point, it's just gonna cost you an intense amount on your budgets with these retirees. So now, um, Aaron, I've, I've dumped all the bad news. So Erin's going to come in and she's going to give you some great tools after we do another poll. Thank you, Katie, so much for all that information. We really appreciate it. So in just a minute, I'm going to launch our second polling question. 
you should see that pop up on your screen. So what office or Department of Government do you represent? So we'll give everybody a few seconds to answer this. And again, if you missed the polling question, don't hesitate to submit your response in the Q&A function. Uh, looks like most people have responded. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out the poll and share the results with everybody. So we have 65% of you in finance, 5% in public safety, and 25%, I'm just here for the CPE. <laughs> All right, so Aaron, we will turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much, Stacy. So we're gonna jump into some HR metrics that might help you be able to shift the organization or department's uh, focus onto um, building a stopgap so that you don't lose a ton of employees all at the same time and so that you can up your recruiting practices to kind of meet that need that's going to be facing governments very, very soon. Um, Stacey, if you could go ahead and go to the next slide. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you so much. So just to start, why look at these metrics? Um, so first of all, you're going to want to get buy-in from your team. So with recruiting intention and retention being team efforts, you'll really need a team behind you. Um, you'll, you'll be able to use financial metrics to put into words the way low staffing will impact, um, not, just, not just your day-to-day -day lives, but also the taxpayers' opinions of the leadership that you're providing in your office. Um, so by using these features, um, you can look at how reducing turnover can then turn into additional taxpayer dollars that you can use and reappropriate to other retention and recruiting efforts um, or other efforts as well. All right, so we'll start with retention and turnover rates. Fairly common, I'm sure none of, none of these terms are gonna be new to anyone, but um, again, we're just looking at them all in one place so that we have a good, a, we have a good solid foundation for you to build a good argument. So as far as retention rate, um, so you're going to start with the number of, de of department employees in the beginning of a period over the total number of department employees at the end of a period. Um, and then you're, the opposite of that. So retention is, you know, who you've held on to. The opposite of that is going to be your turnover rate. So how many, how many employees did you lose? So there's how you can compute that metric right there. So if the average turnover currently for local government is roughly 8 to 10 percent, let's just say, um, and your average cost per hire in your department or office, is let's say 15,000. If you're able to shift your efforts to reduce your turnover by just 2%, um, you could potentially save $150,000. And what could you do with $150,000? So that's why this metric is so important. So um, let's also look at determining cost per hire. Um, so kind of looking at a pretty extreme example here um, with the cost per hire for a police officer, um, but um, it does really illustrate um, how important this is. So the time that it can take to hire a police officer and get them fully trained so that they are functioning independently on their own can take up to 18 months, which is absolutely a um, shock, shocking number. Um, but the, so the total cost of bringing on a new employee to the company is going to be your cost per hire. Um, so if you want to dive into this table that's on here, so let's estimate your recruitment costs between recruitment fairs, between any kind of ads that you've placed, um, any recruiting efforts and the salary of those that attended those recruiting events, let's just ballpark it at about $3,000. Um, now these figures are coming straight out of um, a true life example in Boulder, Colorado. Um, so let's say the annual salary of a police officer is $60,000. Um, and the total time for initial training is 22 weeks. Um, so your cost per hire is gonna factor in not just those recruitment costs, but also the salary during that training period. Because during that training period, they're not functioning independently. They're not out on the streets patrolling anything. Um, so that is gonna be another 25,000 give or take. There's also the cost of their benefits while they're in training because 
yes, they are an employee. So uh, the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics has determined that the average cost of benefits for employee compensation is 38.1% of the employee's annual pay. So using that figure for 22 weeks, I mean, that's almost another 10 grand that's being invested in that officer while they're just learning what they've even signed up for. Um, signing bonus, if that's applicable, maybe it isn't, uh, but it's something to consider when doing your own calculations. Um, any kind of pre-hire testing. So in this example, uh, there are things like um, uh, mental capacity and stress tests, um, pre-hire uh, drug testing, uh, fingerprint testing, um, uh, any other, any kind of personality test that you might pay into yearly, um, anything like that would fall into that pre-hire testing category. And then equipment. I think this is where this particular example is very relevant to those of you that are in public safety. However, um, the equipment cost for a police officer is obviously going to be much higher. There's gun, there's badge, uniform, there's a car um, involved, so much higher here, uh, but still something to consider. Um, for all departments and all offices. Um, and then the cost of training itself. Um, so what did the course cost to put that officer into? Um, and so when you look at the cost per hire, um, you know, kind of filling in your own numbers into these, into this grid, um, you can determine the cost per hire for, for your employee as well. So there are some other intangible costs for hire that are harder to equate, but definitely worth considering. Um, so things like um, how it impacts the team. Um, so when overworked employees are filling in, um, they can tire more easily, um, which can add to increased accidents or increase in error rates. Um, it can lead to just a negative feeling within the team, which can uh, lead to more, I call it wine time, W-H-I-N-E. So um, no more whining, more grievances, perhaps even union activity. Um, as far as how it impacts the individual employee, so rusty people doing unfamiliar jobs, um, certainly decreases productivity. You can't get things done as fast. Um, there's not that muscle memory that comes into play. Um, and it can certainly cause frustration and then uh, cause more people to quit as well, um, which means it's just a, it's just a ball kind of rolling downhill. Um, snowball, that's, that's the term. <laughs> and then uh, cost of management, time and effort. So when people are making mistakes, when people are making errors, um, there's going to be more um, management attention needed to catch those mistakes, um, to uh, fix any kind of errors. And often managers are filling in themselves. Um, so they'll skip their normal management planning and time can't be spent on developing the best employees. Um, and so that can lead to their frustration, which Again, plays under that snowball. Um, customer impacts, so or constituent impacts, uh, taxpayer impacts. Um, it can make your taxpayers if they don't feel like they're getting the service that they that they feel they deserve. Um, they could feel like the organization doesn't care about them. Um, so, oh, uh, quick, sorry, Stacey, quickly go back to that slide. Um, you'll see on the slide. Um, we just kind of laid out details of how that might impact you specifically in the financial accounting department. Um, and so hopefully some of those kind of hit home for you. All right, Stacey, next slide. Okay, so this chart, I just thought was a really great visual um, to display how when you first hire a, an employee, so cost of value of, of that employee, um, it can take some time to even break even and all the costs that you're going to be spending to bring this person on. Um, and so kind of keeping that in mind as you're as you think about training time as an investment. Um, so there's the new hire phase, the onboarding phase and training phase. And at all that point, maybe you're starting to get a little bit of work out of them, but they're but really they're not. So um, they're not performing the way a more tenured employee would. Um, and so it's going to be different for everyone, but going back to that um, police officer example, um, it's going to take about 18 months to get that employee up to that red line where they really start to add value to the organization above what's being, what's been invested in them. So if you uh, did want to, sorry, back on the last slide, <laughs> um, there is also a case study right out of uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, of um, 
of an example of a government uh, that has um, put a lot of retention practice of these retention practices that we're going to talk about. Um, so we'll add that into the chat and include that in some of the materials that we're going to be sending out after the webinar. All right, so let's get your organization, department, office, uh, what have you, uh, prepared for this silver tsunami that's that's coming. So batten down the hatches um, and really make a case um, for your team to shift to recruiting and retention. Um, so you're armed with you're armed with all these facts and figures. So you're armed with your turnover rate, your retention rate, uh, the average cost per hire, um, using all those metrics. So you have all that information. Um, next would be to identify vacancies um, and any potential upcoming vacancies by reviewing your organizational chart. Um, so take a look uh, at anyone that you know you know has expressed interest in maybe moving out of the area or uh, in retiring in the next few years. Um, anyone that's of age of age to retire, I would make a note of that if you know. It, maybe they're 20 years in and um, they're of eligible retirement age. Um, so identify those holes, and then you're gonna want to come up with a system to prioritize those needs. So here at James Moore, we use um, a levels, we use four levels. Um, our level one is all hands on deck. We have to uh, fill this position or we're not going to be able to continue to function as normal. So it is one of those critical positions that needs to be filled right away. Um, level two is going to be this, this position is going to add value. It's going to um, make us more productive and it's a very important, per, uh, important position to add to the organization. Level three is our normal as budgeted uh, recruiting practices where we're, there are some positions that we're just always looking for. Um, and you probably have some of those job requisitions that you just really never close um, and you hope to make a certain amount of those hires per year. So I would call that a level three, just one of those very consistent um, uh, requisitions. And then level four, which is a very nice to have. Let's always keep our eyes peeled for this person who could add value to our organization. So come up with a system that works for you um, and then start by prioritizing because you can't tackle it all at once. You're going to have to start with one, two, and three and work your way from there. Um, another very, well, it's a very effective and um, not costly at all is implementing exit interviews. So when people do leave, um, take 30 minutes, 45 minutes to find out why, um, what could have been done differently. Um, People are going to be more honest to, with you on their very last day of work than they maybe they have been the entire time. Um, maybe some of that has to be taken with a grain of salt, um, but maybe not. And maybe that honesty is going to provide you with a lot of clarity. Um, but start implementing exit interviews for anyone that is leaving your organization. And then on the flip side of that, also implement some stay interviews in your HR practices. So stay interviews are critically important for new employees. Uh, so you're going to want to touch base with employees at 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months, uh, and then pro they'll probably fall into uh, the norm normal performance reviews that you will do. So six months and then a year. Um, but you're most likely to have turnover within uh, the first year that an employee works for you. So it's super important to stay really on the pulse of how they're feeling about their job, how they feel that they're fitting into the culture, um, and how they feel like they're being a positive or having a positive effect, positive effect on the organization. So another, um, another way to prepare for the future is going to be to interview your top performers. So being proactive about the creation of how to documentation. Um, there's a lot uh, that you'll probably notice now um, that you do in your job every day that you, you don't even think about how you would train someone on it because you've just been doing it for so long. So those are the processes that you're gonna wanna get, have written down. Um, so we call them in HR SOPs or standard operating procedures. Um, you can call them whatever you would like to. Um, that's a pretty uh, common term, but any kind of how-to documentation that's going to 
um, just get things down on paper as to how those jobs are performed. And you're going to want your top performers to weigh in on that um, so that when they do leave the company or they do retire, um, that knowledge gap is lessened. So this could um, also be incorporated into your performance review process. It's going to make it a little bit lengthier, um, but it does um, create um, a time where you can easily update things and keep things current. Um, so in those interviews, you're going to focus on things like the skills needed to do the job. Um, you're going to document any contacts or relationships, resources that they are using to get their jobs done um, so that that knowledge gap isn't lost as well. Um, and then once you have this information, you'll want to use it to then revise the job descriptions of the team members um, and then eventually to actually write job ads if you ever are replacing those positions. So, um, and here's actually where that case study is, is listed. So we'll put a link to that. All right, so as far as the candidate market, we all know right now it's, it's really, I mean, we see now hiring signs everywhere. It's really difficult to find people in general. Um, so from a drizzle to a downpour. So let's talk about some different ways that we can um, try to up the flow of applicants uh, to some of your job postings and current vacancies. Um, so, so <laughs> this is not all on government, but I will say in my time as a job seeker and in the five years that I've spent in the recruiting profession, I would say government, sorry, probably the most guilty of just taking a job description and putting it out there on Indeed or Google or um, Glassdoor, whatever platform they're recruiting on, LinkedIn. Um, so a job ad versus a job description is going to be taking the approach that you're paying for this message that's kind of hitting the internet. So let's make the most of it. So let's hit job seekers with what they want to see. So um, one really big thing <laughs> to consider is that nobody wants to read. Um, I think it's something like 60% of people are looking for jobs on their phone. So really long paragraphs and um, job descriptions that go on and on and talk about like push-pull weight limits that you're going to see in a job, I, that's not going to be relevant to what they're going to want to read about. Um, so you'll want to you'll want to format an ad in a way that's really going to be optimized for a mobile search. So instead of um, having long paragraphs that describe the job, you'll do maybe a short two sentences followed by mostly bullet points that are going to make it easier for um, job seekers to, to read. Um, you're going to want to start with what appeals to them first. Um, so for Gen Zers and Millennials, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, they want purpose. They want to know that they're making an impact in the community. So are you, if you're advertising for something like an administrative assistant in the tax collector's office, I mean, Yes, it's it, that's what the job is. Or let's say admin, admin three or something. Um, let's sell that to a candidate. So talk about how that office provides for future infrastructure, um, parks, services, roads that will serve the people of your community, uh, and highlight that to the job seeker um, above knowledge of PowerPoint and knowledge of Word. If that makes sense. So job responsibilities are going to be important because um, you want them to know what kind of job they're applying for and keep it really simple. Um, so just make sure that they get an understanding of what's going to go on day to day and what they'll be responsible for. But things like other duties as assigned, save that for the job description. That will come into play, but that's not going to sell that or that's not going to tell them, you know, what they're signing up for or what they're applying for. And then last, highlight skills that you really need brought to the table here. So try to exclude years of experience when it's not necessary. Is, did the person that left the role have 20 years of experience? Yes. Is that, is that necessary in the next person that you hire? Um, there's, a, there's an ongoing meme I see often um, spread around social media but about someone needing a position that requires 10 years of experience in a software that's only created five years ago, performed by someone who's five to seven years out of their bachelor's program. And it, you know, it's, it's laughable and funny, 
but let's not be guilty of <laughs> laughable and funny when we're writing our job ads. All right, so appealing to uh, Stacey, if you can do next slide. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. All right, so we're going to focus on millennials and Gen Z because um, that is, I mean, millennials make up a huge chunk of the workforce, and um, Gen Z is what's coming out and graduating college at this point. Um, and so that's who we need to start focusing our recruiting efforts on. Um, so, again, making a positive impact is super important to these generations. Um, so just keep in mind that uh, these are, you know, emphasize the, the point that these are your tax dollars at work making an impact in your community. Um, discuss, you know, why this job is important to the community and the difference that it's making. The why behind the what is very important to those generations. Um, diversity and inclusivity is going to be really important to Gen Z workers. Um, they really want to work for a company that has a variety of different voices and opinions brought to the table when making decisions. Um, we know that that's um, been a really hot topic uh, in recruiting as of late, and I, it will not be going anywhere. Um, so be sure that your, your efforts um, in diversity and inclusion are highlighted and communicated to uh, those that are to job seekers. Um, as far as flexibility, so um, we just are slowly uh, getting out of a very flexible time where um, Gen Zers especially uh, spent the last year doing um, school from home, school on their computer. Um, millennials uh, were working from home or we are all working from home, right? Um, so there's a level of flexibility that has almost become an expectation. Um, so things like flexible schedules or job sharing programs, um, you know, they might seem, they might not be the way we've always done it, right? But at the same time, they could offer flexibility that will help you both in recruiting and then maybe even to better serve your constituents. If you had somebody that was on a job share program, perhaps you could, they would have a, a different schedule. So that would allow you to open up 30 minutes earlier in the morning, stay open 30 minutes later in the evening, make it easier for your your constituents to be able to um, to come into the office, and um, so just a different way to look at it, and kind of an out of the box thing to apply. Um, as far as um, wellness programs, um, so Katie already touched on on that, um, but mental health is particularly important to these generations, um, especially in the wake of COVID. Um, so anything that you are doing to promote wellness within your but your organizations or offices is going to be super important to highlight and to to speak about um, and then 401k programs um, very important to uh, still to millennials and gen zers um, the thing is, is i know some of you on the call might have been around when there were pensions and pensions seem to be going by the wayside now but we don't need to talk about that when recruiting just focus on what's positive focus on your 401k program um, and then think about utilizing social media. So um, just thinking about your brand. Um, so instead of posting things to a Facebook or Twitter or Instagram um, that are just a job ad or just a, we're hiring for this, um, incorporate some fun things that you do in your day to day. So um, you know, did you celebrate Rick's birthday last week? Um, did you go on a team out into a baseball game? Um, those are things that are going to get the message out and help you be mindful in um, Gen Zers and Millennials' eyes. So just remember, they're always scrolling. So if you can just be top of mind and be in that news feed, that's going to help you uh, stand out when it's time to uh, when it's time for them to look for a job. And so I can't emphasize this enough. Um, so start early, start really early. <laughs> um, so harness millennials and Gen Zers drive for public service really early through things like apprenticeship programs, internship programs, leadership development programs, which is actually a really uh, non-costly way, it costs a little bit, but um, relatively inexpensive way to uh, get the word out about 
your organization um, and um, what you do in, in your day to day. So um, what we do here at James Moore is um, we target sophomores in college and we invite them in for a day. They'll spend the day job shadowing in various departments. Um, we'll do a fun team building activity. We'll bring in bagels in the morning and lunch in the afternoon. Um, so really, it's uh, other than, a, you know, a day's worth of time and, um, you know, some some Panera. Um, it's a relatively inexpensive way to engage with young students, to get the word out to um, to those that might potentially be going into an we hope going into an accounting program. Um, and if they hadn't thought about accounting before, or maybe they were between accounting and a different major. Um, you know, we we try to pull them into our organization that way. Um, so that's another way that you can um, think about think about uh, appealing to. Um, to that generation. Um, and then consider partnerships with even local high schools. So many students now are um, going the more cost effective route of doing dual enrollment programs. Um, it's not just cost effective, it's also very um, timely. So they'll graduate with their high school degree and their AA at the same time. So they only have to spend two years in university before they have their bachelor's degree. Um, so partnering with local high schools um, will allow you to get in front of those students that are going to be soon graduating with an AA degree. So. All right, so we talked about recruiting. So now we're gonna shift to building a retention levy because we don't want our quality employees leaving us, right? So um, it's important to start with finding out what's most important to them. Um, so establish a feedback process. Um, and um, doing by doing that, so you can use employee engagement surveys to um, to take the pulse on what's important to them. You know where the organization might improve, um, and then it's important to communicate the results of that back to the employees. And then obviously you're not going to be able to fix everything. You just won't be. That's impossible. Um, but you can pick three that you can address. Um, some are as simple as um, maybe establishing a feedback um, center, so a little card box, locked card box uh, with note, notepads um, and um, just collecting those suggestions every week so that you can hear from your employees in real time. Um, and then um, a collaborative culture and participatory leadership. Um, Katie had a really good example from her time in government uh, that she was going to actually share on this topic. So interestingly enough, uh, I told you we had some morale issues during my time at, uh, as a senior HR director at Camden and specifically in fire and EMS. And I started touring the different stations, trying to get some feedback, trying to really dig down what was going on. And it was all about voice. The, the employees felt like they're, you know, if they, they came off as challenging or challenging authority, if they had suggestions and it looked all punitive. So I originally came from healthcare and they had nursing service councils. So a department had a nursing council and then a hospital entity had a nursing council and they had a huge giant council and each council reported up, you know, to leadership. There was no leadership involvement. It was only staff. So I went to the chief of fire and kind of approached him on this idea carrying over to fire rescue. And that's what we did. We developed a council. It was, it had a member from each district. Uh, lieutenant and below, no captains and above involved, so no leadership involvement, and they would address different issues facing in the department. If we went from everything from they weren't allowed to stop at restaurants or the grocery store during shift to Wi-Fi problems to ideas on increasing, you know, their uh, match and their retirement, uh, T-shirts, it was all uh, uniforms, everything was covered and anything, but they didn't have to present their their suggestions to the chief. It was actually my job. So I became the face. They didn't think that there would be any punitive association with the ideas that they come up with with me. So I was a sacrificial lamb, which I was glad to do. And uh, interestingly enough, I would present it to him. He would give me his notes, changes. A lot of times he just adopted it. He thought they were great ideas. And then we would roll it out. They loved it. To this day, they still do it. Uh, it was great. It took a while for them to really believe in the process. But as they saw change as a result, they really got buy-in and they felt like they were making a difference. So that's a really good idea. It's really easy. It didn't cost us anything. We made bylaws the whole nine. They voted in who they wanted in. It, it was really great process. So, and I, I did see a lot of great change from that actually. So, 
So that's my thing. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> All right, so some other um, some other things to think about. So um, wellness and life balance programs, we've talked about wellness, um, but then life balance. So this can be of absolutely no cost to the organization. Um, so a life balance example would be to uh, partner with a local dry cleaning company um, and have them come do a pickup once a week for your employees. Um, so your employees don't have to spend the time either before work or after work dropping off and picking up their they're dry cleaning. Um, the cost is passed straight to the employee. Um, and it really takes not a lot of time to set up, but it's a value add for your employees. Maybe bringing someone in once a month to wash cars, um, another value add for your employees, something they don't have to do on the weekend. And it's up to them if they want to participate in it. But if it's going to save me time, I'm always going <laughs> to probably participate in it. Um, and then fun and community involvement. So um, try to make community days and any day that you get out in the, in the community as fun as possible. Um, things like open communication and open door policies, um, super important and do uh, lend a hand to uh, better retention levels. Um, and then um, one actual idea for those of you that might still be operating virtually actually with, um, with open door policies, um, is to schedule two hours a day where um, you kind of leave your calendar open for employees to come to you with anything that they, any questions that they have to ask. Um, it, it works like time blocking, so you can actually be more efficient in your day to day, um, but because employees will save their questions to that two hour time block, but it also makes, makes you seem very approachable as a leader to um, have that block of time on your calendar where you are you know, open office hours, if you will. Um, and so just making that known in a virtual setting, I know has been really powerful for some of our clients as well. Um, recognition plans. So that doesn't have to cost a fortune. Um, it doesn't have to um, be much more than um, an email or a, um, a recognition at a, um, a staff meeting um, for a job well done. Um, Something public, something um, where other people can see it, um, that does uh, that does play into. That's part of a recognition program. So think about things that you can do to um, be more vocal about uh, anything that someone is or someone in your organization is achieving. Um, and then flexibility, we already talked about, but I did want to talk a little bit about mentorship programs. So. This is big, um, not only for retaining employees because mentors feel like they're giving back to other employees and that makes them feel very valued and needed. Um, new employees like being paired up with a mentor because they feel like they have someone to go to to ask questions. Um, but it's also really helpful with succession planning. So um, just, and part of being a learning organization. So you're investing in that human capital by literally having them invest in each other. So it doesn't cost anything except time and it doesn't take away from any leaders time either um, because you're, you're really just pairing top tenured employees with newer employees along the way all right and with that um, we'll kind of jump into our last polling question thank you Erin so I am going to launch our third and final polling question and you should see that on your screen in just a moment. So I am most interested in learning more about recruiting Gen Zers, retaining current employees, succession planning, or other HR services. So we'll give everybody a few more minutes to respond to the polling question. I did notice a few of you submit your answers through the Q&A function previously. So I do wanna let you know that we did get those responses. And it looks like most everybody has voted. So I'm gonna close that out and share the response. So it looks like 45% are interested in learning more about retaining current employees, 11% recruiting Gen Zers, 32% succession planning, and 12% other HR services. Wonderful. All right. So, Erin, back to you. <laughs> Actually, Katie's going to close us close us out. Here. So, <laughs> just to wrap stuff up, um, I hope we covered you know the problems you guys are facing. I hope you learned a little bit about human capital management and how it really reflects your bottom line. I hope you've got some tools. Um, 
sorry, <laughs> I hope you got some tools that, you know, whether it be metrics, um, just different examples that you can kind of reflect upon and apply to your organizations. And then, of course, we hope you get some takeaways as well on ideas of cost effective ways to retain and recruit your employees. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Katie and Erin, for your time today. Um, our next webinar event is going to be held on June 9th, and it's Gatsby 84 and 87 Deep Dive. So if you haven't already registered, we encourage you to do so. And here's the URL um, to register. And we do have some time for questions. And we had a few that came in. Give me just a minute to pull them up. So, Erin and Katie, are you seeing clients having difficulty filling open positions? Yes. Yes. Erin's <laughs> no more recruiting, but I have to hear it as well. So I'm going to let her take that one. Um, yes. Um, clients, right now the labor market is extremely tight, um, and it's it's been very hard to find um, even, even jobs above the $17 an hour threshold that they're kind of um, saying is, oh, below that, you, you can't hire anyone. Actually, even above that, I mean, it's been that way for years, um, but the the market seems to be changing, particularly um, here in Florida. Um, with remote work becoming so common over the last year, um, other states have actually targeted people that live in Florida um, because we don't have state income tax. Um, so they're able to hire people on a remote basis to work for their California, New York, any other state company um, and pay them less because we don't have state income tax. So um, it's been, uh, the challenges and the competition for talent um, have actually been harder than ever. Do you think there are certain departments that are, positions are more challenged to fill or that you've seen, you know, which departments struggle the most with well, if you're, right now. Um, you're talking, you know, local government wise, uh, public safety has always struggled, uh, specifically 911. I didn't even touch on that. 911 operators, that is, that was a struggle seven years ago. That was a struggle 10 years ago. It's a very difficult field to attract and, and, and turn over and it's really high as well. There's a constant revolving door. Mm -hmm. So we had a couple questions come in regarding exit and stay interviews. Do you think exit interviews are really effective? Um, they can be. I actually like the idea of stay interviews more because I'd be like rather personally capturing that information while people are still there to make my adjustments and potentially retain them versus, oh, I found out after the fact. Because typically, you know, you're not going to exit interview somebody who's going like a, an involuntary term. That's, a, that's typically good turnover. So the people you are actually extra interviewing are the people you would wish have stayed. So I'd rather do a stay interview versus an actual exit interview. Sure. And do you recommend reposting constantly open jobs or just leaving them up all the time? So you will actually lose your free organic traffic on any job sites that pull free ads from your ATS system if you post more often than every two weeks. So you can post at, um, at the every two week mark or two week in one day. Um, but if you post repost any more often than that, then you will your, your job will get pulled from the site and perhaps even the company pulled from the site for a 30 day, 60 day. It depends on how many times you violate the policy. Um, there was a question about obtaining a copy of the webinar um, so that you can share it with your team. And yes, we We'll be sharing the recording of all of our webinars. We'll be posting them on our website, and we'll send an email near the end of the or the series with a link to all of the recordings. So those will be available. And if you want to download the copy of the presentation again, you can do so now in the handout section of the webinar. Um, has the shortage in the labor has the sort shortage in the labor market forcing employers to raise starting wages? Well, some of that is also with the upcoming shift in minimum wage. There's been a little bit of a trend of hiking wages to reflect that. But again, in private sector, they have a little more flexibility to raise wages in the middle of a budget, whereas 
local government, not so much. You're kind of more, you know, really handcuffed to your budget. So the flexibility is really not there. So it's a little bit more difficult, but yes, there is a trend that they're trying to adjust and make those adjustments. Sure. And then we had another question come in. Where's the best place to post jobs? Newspaper ads seem to be expensive and unaffected. So my recommendation um, is going to be to play to your audience. Um, so, um, you know, recently working with a client who needed to find a writer. Um, so we posted um, on a journalist website. Um, if you're trying to look for someone um, in administrative role, let's just say just because it's the most common or an accounting role as well. Um, Glassdoor is a really good place to post. Indeed is going to be the most common place to post. Um, and with their new software that they're beta testing, um, they can actually even, they, they operate and organize candidates much like an ATS system. Um, and so once that rolls out completely, if you don't have an ATS system, it's a really, really helpful tool to um, organize the candidate process. Um, they'll even, if you haven't sent a rejection letter to a candidate that you can even set up an automation feature to auto reject and send an email to a candidate um, they're really working on some robust features um, including integrating uh, interview schedules i don't work for indeed i'm totally on a soapbox but um, they they are certainly at the forefront of, um, of job postings linkedin is huge too especially if you're yeah. high performers and the, say it's a department that they work for getting them to share to their cohorts that they're connected to on LinkedIn. That is huge. That, that really is a great candidate pool. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a few minutes left. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to submit them now and we'll get to them. Um, for those of you who are interested in reaching out to Katie and Aaron, please don't hesitate to reach out to them directly with any questions you have regarding the HR process within your department. And ladies, it looks like there are no further questions. So I wanna thank you all for joining us today. I hope you have the great rest of your day and please stay safe and healthy. Take care.